Bibles, turn over to Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 to 27. I want to be deliberate this morning, trying to get to the end uh, today in a timely fashion, um, because we've been talking about a reigning body. We're talking about the church of Jesus Christ, and um, there's a lot of tradition concerning church. Uh, a lot of people have an idea of what church should be. Uh, people have been associated with church that has created a lot of tradition. You understand when God set up the tabernacle or the temple and he set up the Levitical priesthood and the high priest, uh, he had a purpose for them to communicate the things of God to his nation. But unfortunately, they turned God's word into a tradition. Uh, and as a result of that, he was um, pretty firm with that group of people when he came to planet Earth. In essence, he's saying, you're really not doing uh, the position that my father created as he created it. And it's like that in this dispensation called the church. Uh, I was raised in a denominational church, and the reality is the church I'm in today, in one sense, is the denomination. Uh, we have an organization. Uh, although we may not uh, be receiving things specifically as far as curriculum, and, and they are pointing people in this church to be the pastor, the organization may be different, but the reality is I believe the same thing as a lot of other people that are associated with the school I graduated from. Some denominations can be a little more formal, meaning, you know, a pastor could get put in place for about two years and then they rotate them out. They have a system by which they do things. And as a result of that, they may wear certain clothing as well. They may do certain things within their services. And so, you know, if you've uh, uh, been a part of some of those denominational churches, uh, you might be shocked when you show up and see me in a pair of jeans. Right? You may be shocked because we don't do communion every service. Um, there's a lot of things that you could be shocked about because it doesn't uh, line up with your experience of a place called church. Uh, but the Bible is very specific about what his church looks like. And it has to do more in a bunch of unseen areas, more so than it does in a bunch of seen areas. And if we don't watch out, we'll hold to a tradition of church more than what God is actually doing. You know, there are church plantings that are going on right now and going into different communities, and they have a pretty good system of how that church looks. And honestly, across the board, they could basically look the same and respond the same and have the same time frames. And, hey, if that's working for them, great. Uh, but the reality is I know the Holy Ghost knows the needs of individual people, and I can't really dictate how long worship goes, nor can I dictate when the gifts can and cannot flow. I mean, I could do these things, but I choose to allow God to have his expression. Plus, I want him to be able to minister what he wants to minister. So I'm not stuck within the, the um, constraints to preach an Easter message on Easter. Amen. Or to preach about the birth of Jesus during Christmas. Amen. I'd much rather preach what Jesus wants. Now, if he wants that, then I'll preach it. Um, but we need to go to Scripture and see what his church looks like because he's building his church. Amen. Amen. So Ephesians chapter 5, about the time I'm fixing to go to it, they pull it off. Um, <laughs> Ephesians 5, 25 to 27, it says, Love, uh, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her uh, that, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. Now, we've been ministering on these lines for a few weeks now. Uh, as I said in first service, I would prefer to be able to minister on different topics every service, something different. Uh, I like that myself personally. You know, I like to hit an area, then let's go to another area, let's go to another area, because there's so much that we need uh, to receive from God. But sometimes the Holy Ghost needs to dissect or peel back layers of truth so that we, because you just can't get it in one service. And sometimes he has me focus on a particular area like he has now the church. I haven't actually preached on the church in this kind of detail for quite some time, to be honest with you. 
where I've kind of gone line upon line, precept upon precept. So the Lord's asked me to step over into an apt-to-teach role to where I need to kind of peel this thing back because you understand Jesus loves his church. And the children of God need to love the church as much as he does and need to see the church like he sees it. And so it takes some time for us to peel past your tradition or the tradition of those who go online to listen to us um, because, you know, God wants the true expression of the church that he's building. And the first thing we saw in this passage of Scripture in Ephesians is that Jesus loves the church. Yes, amen. Uh, he's not upset with it. He's not mad at it. Uh, he loves it because he knows which ones are his. He knows the ones he's building. As we've said in the past, in our past uh, weeks of study, it says, unless the Lord build the house, they that labor, labor in vain. Many people are building things, but it's a, it's a vain labor, meaning at the end of it, when it's all built, uh, is God in it? And God will let you know. We know in Revelations that there are seven churches that Jesus talk, uh, talks concerning, and some of those churches, he's having them, he's uh, admonishing them and then rebuking them and saying, you're going to need to make this change and repent or I'm going to pull myself from you. So just because you drive by the streets of the United States of America and see a church on every corner does not necessarily mean that Jesus is at that building. Are you with me? Now, that doesn't mean his word's not being preached because even the Pharisees preached the word of God. Jesus himself told the crowds, do, do what the Pharisees say, just don't do what they do. Whatever they say, do, but don't live it like they do. Because they preached a word that would bring power, but they didn't actually live the very word they preached. And there are many congregations that this is the case. So it does us good to go into the word of God to determine what does the church look like that he's building. Why? Because we saw in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, Jesus said, and uh, upon this rock, I will, or, or you're blessed, Peter. He said, I say unto you that you are Peter, and upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades, or hell, will not overpower it. So, again, he's not building the church on the apostle Peter and his literal bones. That is not what he said. What he said is, and upon, uh, and I say to you, Peter, all right, upon the rock that I am the Christ, the king of the kingdom, the king who has come and laid down his life so that you can get in my nation and it will have no end, that's what I'm building my church on, the revelation of God's kingdom. Amen. So, he said, I will build my church. In this statement, it lets us know that God did not delegate this authority, which means I, as a pastor, do not have the responsibility of building his church. I just have a part to play in helping him build his. Right. Amen. If you've ever done any construction or been around a construction site, you know you have an architect who developed the plans. He's laid it all out. They passed all the code. It can be um, built somewhere, but the architect typically is not the one out there actually building. They have what they call contractors, and contractors have what they call subcontractors, which means there's this general contractor who has taken the plans that the architect has said, if you build it according to my specification and everything is in its proper place, this thing will stand. And can be inhabited. Can be useful. So the contractor says, I will build it according to your plan, but I'm not an electrician. I'm not a plumber. I'm not a painter. I'm not a roofer. I'm not a foundation layer. Because of that, I contract those specific areas that they are, they are built to do that part of these plans. And when they come together, because my dad used to be a painting contractor, and so we would show up at the G.W. Robertson houses in Gainesville, Florida, who was the general contractor. And when he put in a brand new neighborhood, my dad was his uh, subcontract painter. And he would come in with his painting crew. I would end up being one of those on a Saturday. I would show up. And you know what? There would be carpenters in there. There would be uh, some electrician in there finishing up a few things. You know, and we would begin to start our... We, I would know nothing about what that guy's doing, electrical panel. I would know nothing about what that carpenter is doing, except 
This phrase that my dad taught me when it comes to carpenters, caulk and paint, make it what it ain't. <laughs> we made a lot of carpenters look good. Caulk and paint, make it what it ain't. They had some big gaps somewhere, drove some big nails. We can caulk and paint that, and it looks like you never made a mistake. Hallelujah. We are like the blood of Jesus over their work. <laughs> Come on, you know what I'm talking about, contractors. All right. Uh, but we would come in there and do. Now, sometimes we needed exclusivity to a home because the new construction, you know, the carpet layer did not come and put the carpet down before we sprayed the walls. Because my dad would walk in there with his airless sprayer and shoot that house in no time. He'd be blowing that thing, man. I mean, I'd be, he said, son, you stay outside and you do your part. He said, you keep this five-gallon bucket full of paint. Don't you let it run out and get any air in my line. Right. Yes, sir. And so, I mean, I'm like 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. I mean, I went to work my dad young, so young that when I sanded the doors, I could only sand halfway up because I wasn't tall enough to get higher. And he would come by and rub that door and say, no, nah, son, that ain't smooth enough. He said, it's just feel like a baby's butt. Okay, so I'd sand that thing more, right? Finally, I got tall enough I could do it all. Amen. And so I'm out there taking that five-gallon bucket, standing up on his truck and pouring it in. I'm watching it, pouring it in. I'm watching Why? Because God forbid <laughs> you let the paint run dry. Amen? And, man, within a day, we'd shoot a whole two-story house like nothing. And it would look awesome. My dad would come out and have paint all over his face except for where he had his mask on. And, man, that thing be done. Well, guess what? Now it's time for the next part. For them to come in and put down, um, um, you know, the carpet and different things. Why? Because we had finished our part. My point is all coming together. And so I myself am only doing my part because Jesus is building his church. And you need to find your part, your expertise, that which you're called to do. That's why 1 Corinthians 12, 18, we said this, which is very important because Christ has a reigning body, not a weak, not a barely get through, not we suffering. I can't, we just hanging on and surviving. Oh, Lord Jesus, man, it's so tough. No, we are to rule and reign in this life as his body. That's what his church looks like. And I'm here to help you see who you are that way. That doesn't mean you won't have opposition, but our king, the head of the church, says, man, in this world you're going to have trials and tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've already overcome it, so that means you've overcome it because you're my body. The head does not conquer something that the body doesn't have a part in that conquering. So whatever Jesus conquered, you conquer. Whatever Jesus whipped, you whipped. Whatever Jesus is over, you're over. Are you with me? Wherever Jesus is placed, which is first then guess where you're at? You're first. Okay? So the church is not this hold on existence. The church that Jesus has built is a group of people who have the revelation that he's the Christ, and if he reigns, we reign. And we're not reigning just in here. Okay. So he said, but now God. Who? God. But now God has placed the members. And just so we understand which members that is, because, again, if he had just said, now God has placed the members in the body just as he desires, people could have negotiated, have taken it out of context, have uh, uh, communicated with some of the fieriest messages that the members are only the fivefold ministry. But he lets us know what the members are or who they are. He said, but now God has placed the members. Here it is. Each one of them. That's you. That's me. That's all of us. Okay? In the body, just as he desires. That's who desires? He desires. So we need to say, Lord, where do you want us? Amen. Too often people are coming to church trying to figure out what the church can do for them. Instead of saying, Jesus, you're the head of the church. Where did you place me? Amen. What's my part to play? Because if you'll find your part then you'll actually get purposeful. Yes. Amen. You're not going to get the fruit out of the church until you get engrafted in it. Right. Right. Amen. Get committed to it. Right. Begin to allow your part to come to pass. Outside of that, it just becomes a place that you hear instruction. And if the church is just a place you hear instruction so that you can become more knowledgeable of God, 
the best you'll ever be on the earth is a Pharisee. But when you become a, become a member of the body of Christ, as we taught last year, where you're, last week, where you're jointed and fitted together, and you're like, I have to be here because I have a part to play, and my part is significant because God put me there, then I'm telling you your life will go to a whole other level. Amen. To where on Monday, you're thinking about Wednesday. Amen. 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 That you're waiting for the next time to assemble. Because this makes such a profound impact in your life that it takes care of your Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. You're outside this um, assembly connection. It will take care. It will cause all those other things to change in your life. But you've got to put the church first. So God places us in the body where it pleases him. Every one of us. Why is this important? Ephesians chapter 4. In Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 7, and we'll go to verse 8, it says this. It says, but to each one of us, each one of us, grace, say grace, grace. was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Now, I can't get in the subject of grace today. We'll not get into the subject of grace. I'll communicate a couple things about grace, but outside of that, I cannot uh, break down the whole subject of grace. There is some error in this teaching on grace um, you know, so we have to rightly divide the word of truth. Um, but what we want to know, uh, see today is that Christ gives us grace to do what we are assigned to do. Okay. So, but to each one of us, grace was, what was it? It was given, not earned, but given. Okay. And how was it given? According to the measure of Christ's gift. Now, Christ is the head of the church. He's the king. He's the one who sits in rulership. And if the head rules, then the body rules. Verse 8, therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive of hosts, uh, led a captive of hosts, um, led a, led, he led captive a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. Now, that means all of us received a gift. The minute you became born again, according to the grace, of Christ's gift in his measure, he has given you grace to fulfill your position. What you could not do by yourself, God has given you the ability, and the way that ability manifests is you've got to exercise it by faith. By faith. If we go on, if we jump down to verse 11, and so we see verse 8 tells us that he gave gifts to men. That means everybody in this room, everybody in this room, God has placed you in the body where it pleases him. I trust that you're here at Anchor Faith Church because you see yourself in the vision of Anchor Faith Church and that God's leading you here and guiding you here and directing you here because he's saying, I can pull a lot of fruit out of you if you'll get connected to this thing called Anchor Faith Church that I ordained before the foundations of the world. Then he goes on and he begins to now communicate that some of the gifts that have been given to men, he breaks down in verse 11. And he said, and he gave some. These are grace gifts that he's assigned to individuals. Because he said he gave gifts unto men. That's not males. That's humanity. So a female and a male have been given a gift of grace to accomplish what they've been called to do. I mean, Chelsea obviously has grace to sing. Amen. Amen. Amen? And every time I hear our recorded song, Love is One, I love the bridge. And usually when I listen to that, because it is in my playlist uh, when I work out. Now, what I listen to when I work out tends to be a little bit um, um, more motivating. I have some Christian artists that... Uh, have a little more motivation in its um, tempo. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of old school anyway. If I told you some of the artists, you wouldn't know who that was anyway. Uh, but with that being said, um, but I have Love is One in because it's fast-paced, right? And I love Love is One when I'm on the treadmill, especially to start because it's about a four-minute song. And about two minutes into my run, I'm ready to quit. But then Chelsea comes on. And I'm like, you go, girl. You go. 
You sing to me now and help me keep this bass going right now. When she hits that bridge, right? There's a grace on her to be able to sing. Are you with me? Now, she has to exercise that by faith. It just doesn't come naturally. For her to get into realms and in worship, she has to get there by faith. Amen. But the grace is there for her to do so. And we see here in 11 that some, and that word, Greek word some means indeed, which means it's emphatic. God's done this. He gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors, some as teachers. Now, I hear people say, well, you know, I ain't into titles. You know, we're all the body of Christ, brother. Well, let me tell you, Jesus gave the title. So if you got a problem with a title, go talk to the Lord. I don't have a problem with the title. Because it's not just a title. There's an anointing associated with an office. And I'm going to tell you right now, at the end of the day, you don't want Brother Earl. Now, you can call me Brother Earl. You can call me Earl for all that matters. Hey, Earl, what's up, Earl? You doing all right, Earl? Brother Earl, you doing good? Sure, and I'll be a saint with you, and I'll be a brother to you, and I'll live the righteous life in front of you, and the fruits of the Spirit will be with me, and the gifts may move so as a, just a brother and minister to you. But if you need the anointing of pastor, then you better make a demand on it. You do not get the lordship of Jesus until you acknowledge the title of Lord. Amen. And you're not going to get the anointing of pastor to help equip you if all I am is your brother. Earl, you're doing all right today? I'm doing just fine. How about you? Oh, I'm preaching better than you're shouting. That's okay. That's all right. That's okay. I know titles are the lowest form of leadership, but when I step into the office, the grace that's associated with this, then all of a sudden something supernaturally happens that I never could have done myself, and it wasn't for me. It was for you. So if you're not getting what I'm in, it's not my fault. Oh, you don't think I'll prove it? Okay, I'll prove it since I heard someone say, yeah, I ain't going to believe that. Oh, yeah, Jesus said a prophet's not without honor except in his hometown. And it says he could not perform any miracles there. You know why? Isn't this Jesus? Isn't that bro Jesus? I mean, his dad's a carpenter in his family here. And because they would not acknowledge the office he held as prophet, he could not heal anyone in his hometown save a few sick people. And it says he showed up to the hometown full of the Holy Ghost and power and had the power to heal, but healing couldn't flow because that's Jesus, my homeboy. And you want to know why miracle signs and wonders are not flowing in the church today? Because Jesus is your buddy, your pal. He's the guy you sit around with and sip drinks with. He's the one you say hallelujah, but you don't expect respect his office. Jesus holds offices. He holds all five of these offices and then one above it called king. If you don't respect the office, then you don't get the anointing of the office. Because if you receive a prophet in the name of a prophet, you'll get a... We talk about five-fold ministry next week. We're setting you up. Amen. But he goes on and says this. These five, these graces that are put on people's lives, not on everybody's, is for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. So notice in this passage of Scripture, when it comes to the body of Christ, first and foremost, we are all saints, but some saints carry an office. And they only carry that office because of the grace of God. What I want to point out today because I was going to be preaching on the five-fold ministry today. I was looking at the teacher. I was looking at the pastor. I was looking at the evangelist. I was thinking about preaching on the evangelist today. But the Lord said, there's still one more thing you must lay in foundation before you can minister on the gifts. That's why we're here today. And that is the grace associated with the body of Christ. Because if you don't understand the grace associated with the body of Christ, then when I start talking about the fivefold ministry, you may desire to be it, although you're not called it. And you never want to be something in God's body that you do not have the grace 
to be. And Jesus lets us know, everybody's a saint, everybody has gifts, but of some of those saints, we have some offices called the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, and the teacher. And that particular office, when it comes to the saints, they will equip them. They'll actually not make them Pharisees, educated people. They'll actually equip them so that they can demonstrate my kingdom in, in every sector of society. When they go out and about, they will reign with me because of the teaching they give, because of the instruction, because of the ministry associated uh, on those offices with those individuals. All right? And then when that happens, the saints will do the work. Will do the work of service. There's an internal work saints will do, and there's an external work saints will do. Both. And because you do the work, the body will be built up. Amen. Hallelujah. So I'm going to do my part. I'm going to equip you. I said I'm going to equip you. I'm going to equip you. Which means sometimes I got to just tell you like it is. Amen. Like a coach. You're not giving you 100% effort. Man, I love Coach Brandon Baloney, man. My gosh, I went over there. He's coaching my grandson in baseball. And so I went over to a scrimmage game. It's a scrimmage game. And so they're out there. And he's on, the, on, on third base coach. And he's like, he, you know, talking to him, talking to him, telling him. He goes, now listen, look for the strikes. Don't be swinging for something up. He's coaching the whole time. Then, when they were out in the outfield, right, he's saying, okay, how many outs we have? Come on, you got to communicate. One out, one out. Where's the play go? Play goes to first. He's what? Coaching them. He's not letting them just sit out there and go. Because they were sitting out there going. He's like, you got to talk to yourself. You got to, and it reminded me of my little league childhood, man, when I was 13 years old and we won the little league championship, man. I mean, I played second base. I was like, man, I'm eating this up. Look at the coach go. And after the game, a scrimmage. This is what he said. That's what he said now. Most of you that left his team. Yeah, you'd have, you'd have said, man, I can't have my kid here. He'd have said, he said, now listen, this is just a scrimmage. But listen, you can't go out there in a scrimmage just because it don't count and be lazy and not put your for, for best effort. The reason we scrimmage is to practice and to get better in the things we're weak on. Amen. Some of you hit the ball and started jogging down first. Just, <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking to myself, my gosh, man. I'm thinking they doing. I'd make them beat their face, man. If I'd have, I'd have first base coach, I'd have been like, get off that bag. Give me 20 for your lazy. Okay. So he's running because what's he thinking? He dinked the ball, went to the pitcher, and he's already convinced. Five, three steps in, I'm out. Do you know what happened? The pitcher overthrew first base. So then he had to get the lead out and barely make it to first. Right? And you're thinking, this wouldn't even have been close if you'd have been doing what you know to do instead of lollygagging around. Amen. You know, that parent didn't pull that child. Hallelujah. But when the five-fold ministry office starts operating, <laughs> you got to worship God today. <laughs> it's time to raise your voice, right? Why are we doing? We're trying to pull in the greatness. We're trying to get another expression of God. We're trying to get your gift to be released so you can reign. Amen. So Paul talks about this grace. Again, not everybody has the grace of the fivefold ministry. Paul uh, speaks to this very specifically. In Romans chapter 12, verses 3 through 6, it says this. Oh, my goodness. For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think... So as to have sound judgment, as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. For just as we are many members in one body, and all the members do not have, uh, and all the members do not have the same function. So we, who are many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Since we have gifts that are different, according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly is to exercise them accordingly. Okay? 
is to exercise them accordingly. So Paul opens this up because he realizes there is a grace given to offices that are and individuals within the body that moves them into a place that saints are not graced to have. And because of that grace, saints can all of a sudden think more highly of themselves than they ought and lust after an office. Why is that? Because as a saint, even if you do not have the grace to be a prophet, an apostle, a teacher, an evangelist, or a pastor, you are not limited to grow in the anointing. You don't have to be in the fivefold ministry to lay hands on the sick, cast out devils, speak in new tongues. Are you with me? You don't have to be in the fivefold ministry for the gifts of the Spirit to flow through you. It's the anointing on your life. And as you yield in the grace of God that He's assigned to you in the local body church, as you yield to the assignment that He's called you to do, and as you yield yourself to the learning and teaching and growing in the Word and He. Yielding to the Spirit of God, you can be used in great measures. Miracles and signs and wonders can follow you. But it would behoove you not to know things about God. And then when a pastor or, let's say, a, a, a younger person is developing in their ministry gift, you begin to say, well, I can preach that better than them. Well, if I was running the church... Well, if you don't have the grace, then you have no idea. And what do saints do? All of a sudden, somebody's dealing with something, they're complaining. Well, I went to the pastor, and the pastor won't. And you're like, well, that ain't right. Well, first of all, as a saint, you don't know what all's going on. Even if the person that is dealing with it is telling you they're one side. Many churches have split. Because the saints trying to operate in a grace gift they don't have. What's going on in your marriage? Come on, tell me. And next thing you know, you're going through marriage stuff. That you're not able really to handle. And all of a sudden, your marriage is falling apart. Because you start looking at your spouse like the one you're talking with is saying their spouse is. How do I know this? I know that the body is different, and we have different functions. And it doesn't mean I'm better. It means I was built for certain things. Meaning, God gave me a grace beyond my capacity that when by faith I trust him, I'm able to operate in something is because of his grace, not because I'm just better than you. I was designed for something. I've said this before. There are round objects on my Jeep, one being a steering wheel, one being a tire. But if I took the tire and put it on where my steering wheel is, and I took my steering wheel and put it where my tire is, even though they're still on the Jeep, they're in the wrong fit, and a steering wheel was never designed, it did not have the grace to handle the weight of the vehicle. And I don't care how much it says I could do better. I'm closer to the person anyway. They touch me all the time. I mean, I know where we're going before you do. Oh, I'm preaching now. Because I'm there with the one moving. And if it wasn't for me, you wouldn't even get. I think I want to be out there like you are. <laughs> and you don't have the grace to handle it. No, you're just a messenger to someone who has to hit the ground. <laughs> Same thing. You want to put that tire on your steering column, and your steering column collapses. Why? Because you put undue pressure on something in the vehicle that never should have had that kind of pressure on them. This is why as a pastor, I'm not putting pressure on people to be in five-fold ministry or putting pressure on people to be something that they're not. Because then I can crush everything below them. Their families. 
Some of you, you're crushing your families because you're trying to get into a five-fold ministry because you're thinking more highly of yourself than you ought, and your whole family's being crushed when they were never to support that. I know when God called me here, I was adamant that I did not want to move my family anymore because I'd just been pursuing God the best I knew how to, and we moved a lot. And so when I graduated, I'm like, man, I just want to get started. Let's plant a church. But God's like, you're not ready. So I moved and, and went to Oklahoma and was a youth pastor there. And I told my oldest son, I said, I'm not even going to think about moving until you graduate. 2005, man, we're here, son. Now, I should have never said it. But, I mean, I was just wanting um, my son to have stability, us to have stability, and let's just stay somewhere for a while. Well, come to find out, the Lord tells me in uh, 2003 that there need, I need to be moving. But I'll swear to my own hurt because I told him I wouldn't. I told my oldest son, I said, listen, I believe God wants me to plant a church in St. Augustine. He's told me it's time to go. But the reality is I told you you'd graduate here. And son, if you want to stay here, God will honor that. No pressure on you, man. None. None. I had pushed off God because I was thinking that we were going to start a church and um, you know, I kept hearing 2004, which is when we would start the church. So I thought, well, why would I move in 2004? My son has one more year. Surely God's not saying that. Well, he wasn't saying that. He was saying move earlier. But I wasn't listening to that. Long story short, my son prayed, spent some time. He said, I believe we should go. He released me of that word. And then at that point, I prayed some more to determine, should I act on that or do I stay anyway? God said, get up and go. We did. And you know what the Lord told me? He says, I anointed your family to be able to handle your call. Now, my kids are not free from failure. My grandkids won't be free from failure. I mean, they're human beings just like you, and they have to deal with the flesh just like I do. But I'll tell you this, they're serving God. The church and the ministry didn't break them. Why? Because there was an anointing. But I've seen many that have hungered to be in a five-fold minister calling that they never had a grace for, and they lose their kids, and they're losing their grandkids. It's because they're operating in something they were never graced to operate in. Now, what you want to do is be exactly where God's called you to be. And do that. And there's no greater reward than being, because whether you're a steering wheel, a tire, or a turn signal, whether you're a radiator or a back seat, doesn't matter. You're a part of the whole thing, and your reward's just like mine. Amen. So let's do our part together. Amen. Let's do our part together. Amen? Amen? You understand, I can jump into certain things, but it doesn't mean I should stay there. I used to play the bass. But you understand, there's other people more gifted with grace in music than I am and get, can give their attention to that, so there's really no reason for me to be up here. And look at the environment of worship we have. Hallelujah. When it comes to grace, there, I'm only going to touch on three graces because there's the multifaceted grace, but I just want to kind of get us in context real fast. They're saving grace. That's God's supernatural ability released towards an individual and enabling him to become a new creature. And that's what we talk about the most is God's saving grace. God's saving grace is associated with another word called unmerited favor. And that tends to be the number one definition we use coming with grace is unmerited favor, unmerited favor, unmerited favor, unmerited favor. Okay, so when you apply unmerited favor over to the scripture uh, in the gospel where it says Jesus was full of grace... Tell me what unmerited favor he deserved. What, what did he do wrong that he got unmerited favor? So that's not the only definition of grace is what I'm saying. The first definition of grace is actually an endowment of power. In essence, grace will empower you to live a God life. So when Jesus was full of grace, the grace he had was the ability to always choose right to not sin so that ultimately he became the lamb that was slain without spot or wrinkle. The grace he possessed was by right of a child of God, and he operated in that grace to never fail. And because of that, we have someone who stood in our gap. Thank God for the empowering grace Jesus had. 
We, on the other hand, are introduced to grace first through unmerited favor because we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory. But the minute we receive his saving grace, then he puts in us in de- uh, empowering grace, which is what we call a standing grace. That's God's supernatural ability released towards an individual, enabling him to stand victoriously and to reign in life. So the minute I made Jesus the Lord of my life, I said, Jesus, I believe you died on the cross and rose from the grave. There's no way to have a relationship except through Christ. I acknowledge him as Lord of my life. My futile attempts do not get me in right standing with you. I trust in the blood of Jesus, and I call him supreme in authority of my life. He is my Lord. I step into the kingdom of God. I become a new creature in Christ. The saving grace is applied to my life now by faith, and then another grace shows up, and it's the ability to stand as a child of God. Woo! Glory to God, which means now I can rule and reign in every circumstance. When trouble comes, I'm standing in the grace of God. When a temptation comes, I stand in the grace of God. When the flesh attacks, I stand in the grace of God, and I can overpower it every time. Because now I'm not ignorant of the devil's devices. I can actually hear the voice of God. And I'm created in his image. But then there's another grace called serving grace. Serving grace is God's supernatural ability released towards an individual, enabling and equipping him to minister with the ability of God. All of us are called to the ministry of reconciliation. But the ministry of reconciliation is not a five-fold ministry. The ministry of reconciliation is as a saint, as a believer, as a disciple of Christ, you can walk in an an anointing and you can represent the victorious life of God in Christ to the world and it will draw them to you. You can walk in the love of God and it will draw them to you and you can share about King Jesus and see people come into the kingdom of God. We're all in the ministry of reconciliation. But for the fivefold ministry... Now, all of a sudden, this saint who's been put the apostle on uh, his uh, or her, um, you know, life, uh, the the prophet, the evangelist, the teacher, the pastor, that anointing's different because there's a grace associated with it. And as a result of that, they receive a supernatural empowerment and equipping to minister to the saints. Are you with me? So with that being said, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, Paul says this, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for the sake of you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace, which was given to me for you. Paul recognizes, again, I'm doing what I'm doing because God gave me this grace. He goes on, jump down to verse 7, he says, For, or of which I was made a minister because of the grace, because of the you know, apostleship he has. He's also held the office of the apostle, also held the office of the pastor. It says, of which I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me according to the power, to the working of his power. Verse 8, to me, again, when he recognizes his life prior, how he lived, and when he came into the kingdom, if any saint, it should have passed by, should have been him based upon what he did against God in the first place. He's saying to himself, listen, I'm the very least of all saints, but grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ. So again, before you were in your mother's womb and before the foundation of the world, God knew you. And he knew the grace he would give you in his body. We are in the dispensation of the church. And since God released your spirit into an earth suit at this time, he has a grace for you to do an assignment. All of us. And some, he's given the fivefold ministry. Paul, recognizing I'm only in this because of that, but he begins to release why he has this, and this is powerful. It says, to bring to light what is, what is the administration of the mystery, which for ages have been hidden in God, whom, who, all, who created all things. Then he goes on and says, so that the manifold wisdom of God might be made known, might now be made known through the church, to the rulers and the authorities in heavenly places. Verse 11, this was in accordance with the eternal purpose. God's what? Eternal purpose. 
which he carried out in Christ our Lord, in whom we have boldness and confident access through faith in him. I want us to jump back to verse 10 real quick because this is really powerful. This lets us know what the church was supposed to receive. Paul is letting, the, letting us know. You understand this is significant with Paul because Paul has been given a mystery that the Jewish people or the nation of Israel did not even realize was going to come in play. It was this thing called the church, the body of Christ. The nation of Israel was never looking for a body of Christ. They've only been looking for one thing, the king. That's all they're looking for. They've been waiting for the Messiah, the one who would come through the line of David, who would establish his kingdom and have no end. This is who they're looking for. They're waiting for the king, waiting for this king to come and establish their nation that then would rule over all the earth and bring peace to the people. Yet Paul says there's this mystery. There's this thing called the church that God just didn't have a covenant with a man named Abram that he turned into Abraham, but he actually wanted to cut a covenant with the entire human race. That he didn't just want to be the ruler of the nation of Israel and be their king. He wanted to engraft in every people from every tribe and every nation. Woo! Glory to God. So he says right here, he says, so he was made this apostle, this prophet, this teacher. He has this grace on his life so that he would be able to communicate the manifold wisdom of God that it would be known how through the church. Now, manifold wisdom means this, the many sides of God's wisdom. Really what this is saying is God's going to reveal to his people, even the Gentiles, the non-Jewish people, that he has an answer for every circumstance in life and that they would follow the voice of their king, they'll overcome just like he did. That he's not just for Israel, he's for all mankind for all of humanity, and that if they'll call on the name of the Lord, he'll be their king too. Then it goes on and says this wisdom would come through the church. That word through literally means this. It means the ground or reason by which something is or is not done. Now, this is powerful because if you don't catch this, you'll miss the whole purpose of the church. The Bible tells us that the purpose of the church, unlike tradition, because tradition has one section that the church would do, but it's not its purpose. Many people, if you went, say, what's the purpose of the church? They would say, to win the lost. To win the lost. Well, will the church win the lost? Sure, but that's not its purpose. Peter literally tells us what the purpose of the church is. It's to be the pillar and support of truth. And you know what the truth is? If you don't know Jesus as Lord, you're lost and separated from him. But if you'll call on his name, you'll be born again. Which, guess what? One truth the church preaches is to be born again. But that's not the role of the church. And whole congregations are setting themselves up in their teaching and preaching ministry, only talking about one thing, catering to the world. When the Bible tells that the fivefold ministry is not there to cater to the world, but to actually equip saints. And when saints get equipped, then they'll take this uh, uh, manifold wisdom of God into their world and begin to reign in life. And they will dominate in life so much as citizens of the kingdom that the world will say, who is your God and what are you doing so that you reign like you do? Because then the ministry of reconciliation becomes easier because you're not beat down, broke down, depressed on 500 pieces of prescription in divorce. Amen. You're living a totally different existence because we've come to know that we're in Christ. The king reigns. His word runs forever. We can stand in faith. We can walk in. And what we say has authority. Whatever we bind on earth, be bound in heaven. Whatever we loose on earth, be loose in heaven. We're going to operate in the power and plans of God. We do not have a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and of sound mind. We are a reigning church, a reigning body. We are graced to be on this planet for such a time as this and to rule and reign in this life and the one to come. Hallelujah. 
You mean you're not afraid? This is why the mind has to be renewed in the church by the fivefold ministry. Not so, I mean, not so much that you have to run around and beg someone to get into your kingdom, but you live such an existence, they're like, my gosh, what must I do? Now, I'm not saying you're not going to share about Jesus and tell people about Jesus, but I'm telling you, your lifestyle will draw men to Christ when you begin to operate in the authority that he's called us to operate in. See, this manifold grace, uh, manifold wisdom of God, this word God has a, 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 an attachment to it, which means we are vice regents. And a vice regent is the regent's deputy. And regent doesn't mean anything to us unless you look it up in the dictionary like I did. And a regent is this, one who has authority to govern, one who has a life that reigns. So in essence, Paul says, the reason I've been given the grace to the Gentiles is to teach them how to reign as ambassadors for Christ in their world so that when they go out into business, at their homes, at the sports arena, at entertainment, uh, uh, in government, in any sector of society they touch, the kingdom will go with them because I'm instructing them from the embassy when we collect upon the same place. I have a grace to let them know the policies and procedures of the home country so that when they go out, they say, I have no opinion on the matter, but my king says. Right. See, you won't get backed in a corner when people say, well, what do you think about sexual relationships? I have no opinion in the matter, but my king says. Yes. Well, what do you think about I have no opinion in the matter, but my king says, and when you demonstrate what the king says and live what the king says, then all of a sudden, you're deciding what happens and doesn't happen. You can receive plans from God that can change the business environment that you're in right now. Because you are the son of a king. You are the daughter of a king. And the fivefold grace on my life, the, the grace that God has on my life in the fivefold ministry, in the areas that I stand in, is so that you will learn who you are in Christ and begin to reign. Yes. Amen. Because the church Jesus is building is not beat down or broke, barely getting along. Amen. No, it's a collection of people who know who they are in Christ and know they're sons of the King. They're children of the ruler of all creation. And His Word never fails.